تفضل يا اسماعيل بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Tonight on the 17th of Jumad al Thani in the year 1443, corresponding to the 19th of January 2022, we are in the book Al Wajiz, the concise presentation of the fiqh, chap- starting chapter 13, fixed prescribed punishments on page 577. <clears throat> the word hudud, plural of had, originally means the barrier between two things. Lexically, it implies prevention. As a technical term, it means the legally prescribed punishments for sinful acts implemented to prevent such acts from occurring. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawala. Hudud in Arabic means borders. So they put the borders for some things not to mix up. And this is in the language. Had means I'm putting you a limit, a border, a line, so you don't cross it. <clears throat> but when we talk about hudud, <coughs> as a terminology here in the Sharia, it means uqubat, punishments. And actually, it, it And that is, just the microphone now is playing around with me. Allah Mustaan. And that is two things. The awamr, the commands, and the nawahi, which are the prohibition. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Tilka hududullah, fala taqrabuha. These are the limits, the borders of Allah. Do not approach it. So this is a command. Fala taqrabuha, it is prohibition. So tilka hududullah, this is the command. This is are the borders of Allah. So this is a command. Don't. Do not approach it, do not cross it. That means a prohibition. So here it means the set or prescribed punishments, okay, which is being set by the Sharia, by Qala Allah or Qala Rasulullah, regarding a certain act, a certain crime, a certain sin, <coughs> in order for two things. And that is to be Jawabr wa Zawajr. Jawabr means to expiate. So once this prescribed punishment implemented on the criminal, it will be an expiation. He will not be punished in the hereafter. And the secondly, as as well, zawajr means deterrence. So it will deter other people to do the same crime. So this is the basically why we have prescribed punishment. So the prescribed punishment, the hudud, is simply is that something being set by the sharia, as a punishment regarding certain crimes. And we're going to speak, speak about which crime we're talking about here. <clears throat> in order for, number one, <coughs> to expiate his sin. So that person will not be punished in the hereafter for that sin. Number two, as a deterrence, that is for the uh, people to do the same crime. Except in the prescribed punishment of a person who is committing apostasy. That means left the deen. It's not going to be a sin expiation, but actually it will be the penalty of death for a kafir. So it will be deterrence for other people to do this. <coughs> what is to commit apostasy in the open? You could you could have whatever you like in your creed and your aqidah, but to say it open, to confess open, then Sharia will say that the death penalty is the prescribed punishment for such a person. So that in that case, it will be only deterrence for others to do, but it's not going to be a sin expiation for the person who had been uh, uh, having this prescribed punishment, which is death, because he had died upon kufr. Of course, if he wants to repent before that, yes, he's got repentance and he will be saved. Even if he repented just uh, for the sake of saving himself for the punishment, where he's himself inside, he's an atheist. He's not a believer. We don't, we don't care about what he has inside. This is between him and his Lord. What we care about what he did say and what he boasted, what he's claiming to be. So if he said that I, I'm a Muslim and to, that will save him from the punishment, yes. We will talk about it well later on about repenting before the crime and after the crime and how this is going to affect the implementation of the prescribed punishment. 
That is inshallah later on. But it's not in the book. I'm going to add things here to the book. طيب. Now, the Mu'tazila wal Khawarij, those two sects, they say that this prescribed punishment, it is only a deterrence. It is not a sin expiation. Because remember, those two groups, they deal with the sins and the crimes like fornication and drinking and all of that, that he is to be uh, therein for the, in the hellfire forever. So he will be chucked into the hellfire forever. So any person who dies upon fornication without repenting, he is in hell perpetually. That's it. It's not going to be temporarily. Uh, uh, so uh, for them, as I said, the prescribed punishment is only a deterrence. It's not a sin expiation. As we say, we, it will expiate. It is not for them. Fine. Let's talk about those prescribed punishment that the Sharia had set as a prescribed punishment. Which crimes are we talking about? Now, the crimes that call for fixed prescribed punishments. The Quran and Sunnah have laid down specific punishments for specific crimes. These are known as the crimes invoking fixed prescribed punishments. They are fornication or adultery, slander, theft, consuming alcohol, brigandry, apostasy, and rebellion. Right, okay, so here Sharia had made a fixed punishment for the following. Number one, that is, you are transgressing against the, the, the fame, which is defamation, or transgressing against the body, which is fornication. And these two, we call it al-a'rad. A'rad means the honor of the person, whether you are accusing a person, whether he had fornicated, or that he had defamed somebody, those are attack onto the honor of the person. So there's prescribed punishment for them, uh, uh, as we're going to see when we come, for the zani, for the person who's committing fornication, for the person of defamation, is a prescribed punishment. Also, Sharia came to punish and made a fixed prescribed punishment onto the person who transgresses against the wealth of the people, that is stealing. So there is as well prescribed punishment for that. And also, the person who transgress goes, that means he go over the board, over the border, which is with Hudud, and that is regarding his intellect, and that is drinking. So this is a, a crime against your uh, aql. You have made it unconscious that in you have as well a punishment for that. And also for the brigandry. Brigandry is the one that is bandits attack in groups. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is actually aggression or a crime against the life. So it is blood crime against the life. Just like as well, the last one, which is al-baghi. Baghi is well killing. You have a group and you're fighting the khalifa, so-called baghi. So as well, this is a crime against the blood. And, and the final is, well, here, the crime against the deen, which is committing apostasy. Allah azza wa had set I prescribe, fix prescribed punishment for that. Fine. Let's go to the following title, please. The Excellence of Implementing the Fixed Prescribed Punishments. Abu Hurairah narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a legal punishment that is implemented on the earth is better for the inhabitants of the earth than if it were to rain for 40 mornings. Right. So basically, implementation of the fixed prescribed punishment is something that is uh, uh, very good and it's actually basically it will make the society settled and it will make a balance and there will be safety and people will don't have to worry about their cars being left open or their shops being robbed you know the amount of robbery in this country for example i think it's every four seconds there's a crime. So I'm counting one, two, three, four. Somebody's car is being broken. One, two, three, four. Mobile shop has been robbed. The number of mobile shops have been robbed, for example, in Luton. I've got my friend's mobile shop has been robbed twice. Okay. Even they had put somebody to sleep in the shop. And lately as well, about three, four shops have been robbed. Mobile shops. I mean, how, how do you feel safe leaving your shop? Unless you're going to sleep inside it, and just to, you know, and even if you are inside it and you have had to thief there and you, for example, managed to beat him up or with a stick, you poked bo his eye, you're going to be done for that. So the person is not feeling safe. Uh, and it's all of us to do insurance, insurance, and insurance, of course, 
is all of it is not halal. And it's not going to give you everything. Unless you are a criminal as well yourself, you're going to fake things that you had and you didn't have in order to get more money. So Islam brings safety to the society and settlement. So here he says that it's to implement the prescribed punishment as long as it is justified. Because if there is doubtful, Islam says, no, don't implement it. It has to be 100%. Okay? So it is better for the earth to be better than the, having the earth to have rain for 40 days. Rain here, which is a rain that benefits the land, not a rain to cause flood. Father. It is obligatory to implement the law upon, the, upon relatives and non-relatives, upper classes and lower classes. Ubadah ibn al-Samit said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, implement the fixed prescribed punishments of Allah upon the relatives and non-relatives and do not fear for the sake of Allah the blame of any reproacher. The blame, sorry, the blame of any reproacher. Uh, so don't fear the saying of other people. Don't see it, fear that the other country is going to tell you to this country or we, we, this is very barbaric. You implement what Allah says correct. And it's going to be very hard now for Muslim country to implement all prescribed punishment unless secretly. Allah Musta'ab. Because the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are being looked at by people who do not believe in the laws of Allah. And they're going to be, you know, uh, so for example, if you look at America, Death sentence is being pulled out from so many states there. Still, some of the states like Texas, they still have death penalty. But some of them, they removed it because the power, the upper hand was for those people who say, we don't want the death sentence. Subhanallah, somebody who was a serial killer, killed so many people, have no shame and have no mercy. He even enjoys killing the people. He even sold them while they're alive, cut them while they're alive. And still, they're given the opportunity to stay in the prison. God knows for how many years sucking the tax money of the people just to live there. I don't know. I mean, the prison is a prison, yes, but still, it's luxury for him. He wouldn't really like to be uh, uh, killed. And I remember here, uh, subhanAllah, the name is flew from me, serial killer, blunder, blunder, something, blunder, Bundy, Bundy, Bundy. Somebody's called Bundy. Serial killer, well known. And he had killed, the one that he had confessed is about 35, but they reckon is more than 50. And basically, the death penalty, because he was in a state, was caught the death penalty there. SubhanAllah, every time his death penalty approaches, he would say to them, okay, I will give you the location of a body which he himself had buried, nobody and the authority didn't know about it. So he could give him extra time. Why is he scared of death? So they actually made a deal with him and they gave him extra time. And then the extra time had almost and I finish. So he said, I've got another body as well. So they postponed him again. The third time they said, hang on a second. He's got so many people had killed. So they went on to kill him. Uh, because of other families as well, they want to know where their loved ones have been. You know, they want to give them the last sort of respect, whatever it is, the burial of theirs. So as I said, he's scared of death. He's scared of the death that he's imp doing it to other people. So if there was death penalty all the time, these people will be, you know, will be scared. Okay. And the death penalties will take after years. So he's, for example, in prison for 10, 10, 8 years, and then after that, the death comes in. But anyway, the death penalty is a deterrence. Okay? And each country has its own laws. But the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Muslim country, they're supposed to be these laws. And the laws has to be implemented on both. The ones who are next of kin, or the ones who are not next of kin. So it's not because you're a leader, this is your cousin. I'm not going to prevent it upon him. If he's a thief, I'm not going to cut off his hand. And also, I'm not going to implement it only on the ones who are weak, who have no supporters. So the elite people, mm, they are noble. I can't touch them. That's not allowed as well in Islam. What happened as well to the Jews before? The Jews, when they started doing this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala imposed upon them the wrath of his. Why? Because they started changing the laws of Allah azza wa at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu the Messenger of Allah saw somebody who is completely covered with mud, black mud. He's like, he's being put in a bath of mud, okay? And he's being lashed. He asked, what is this? 
He said that uh, he's he had committed adultery. Adultery means he was married and committed the zina. So he said, is this what you find in the Torah? Is it a punishment? In your old in your testimony in your book? He said, yes. So he called on for the rabbis. And he said, I beseech you by the one who sent the Torah upon Musa. This is by Allah Azza wa Jal. Tell me, is that what you find in your Torah as a punishment for a person who committed adultery, this fornication after marriage? He said, they said to him, verily, because you have besieged us by the Almighty, by the one who had sent the Torah to Musa, we cannot lie. No, it is not this. The punishment is stoning to death. But because so many of our nobles, so many of our elites started doing it, we couldn't implement that onto them. So we started implementing it onto just the weak. Then the weak erupted against us. So we said we'll come to a common punishment. We'll make up a punishment, which is not going to be death. It's going to be suitable for both the elite and also the ones who are weak. So the Prophet Sallallahu he said, Alhamdulillah, that Allah made me to the first person to revive the laws of Allah. And then he commanded for him and his, uh, his fornicated woman to be stoned to death. And he was seen that the man was covering the women because of the stones going upon him. Because this is the Islamic state at that time. And they are living within the Islamic state. Even the Jews were saying that go to Muhammad. If he's going to rule with stoning to death, don't make him to judge. If he does the bathing of the bathing of the blood and all of that, then accept his judgment. And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the three, the three verses in Surah Al-Ma'idah. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَيْكَمُ الظَّالِمُونَ فَأُولَيْكَمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ فَأُولَيْكَمُ الْكَافِرُونَ So, prescribed punishment is to be said to everybody. Look at now the head of the state, and that is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet of Allah. What did he say? Fadl. Aisha radiallahu anha said, Usama spoke to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about a woman who had committed theft. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, those before you were destroyed simply because they would implement the fixed prescribed punishments upon the weak and they would leave the rich. By the one in whose hand is my soul, if Fatima had done that act, I would have I would have her hand cut off. This hadith is going to be repeated in a minute again as well. But this is the Prophet Sallam is saying that if we start to implement the prescribed punishment, the fixed prescribed punishment upon the weak and leave the ones who are strong and elite and nobles, then this is going to be a way of giving Allah Azza wa Jal to go ahead to doom or to destroy us. In the Mahalak, they were ruined, they were doomed. Why? Because they don't implement the prescribed punishment justify, uh, injustice or justifiably. Uh, and he says now, if Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, is to steal, I will cut off her hand. No mercy. There's no green card. She's got a green card because she's a daughter of the Prophet. No, she will have her hand amputated. Fadl, the following title, please. Disapproval of interceding in such crimes after it has been taken to the authorities. So disapproval here, the word disapproval is a translation of the word karahia. But actually it is prohibition, I should say. Not disapproval. Prohibition. Haram. It is not permissible. And that is to intercede, to remove a punishment after this crime was lifted or being informed, conveyed to the leader. So if the leader, the sultan, the one who's the Khalifa, the president, the judge, the, the, the matter came to him. So this person had been caught stealing. So you brought it to the judge. This woman, she'd been caught, or this man has been fornicating. This man has been caught, for example, drinking. Then it is haram, prohibited. It is not allowed to now to basically to remove this punishment. The leader and the judge has to implement the prescribed punishment. And now we're going to come to the story of Usama bin Zaid, uh, whom he had interceded for her with the Prophet ﷺ. Fadl. Aisha radiallahu anha said, The Quraysh were worried about a woman from the tribe of Makhzum who had committed theft. They said, Who can speak to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and who can dare to except Usama ibn Zaid, the beloved of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So Usama spoke to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, 
do you intercede in one of the prescribed punishments from Allah? Then he stood and said, O oh people, those before you went astray because if a noble from among them would steal, they would let him go, while if a poor person among them stole, they would implement the punishment upon him. By Allah, if Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, were to steal, Muhammad would have her hand cut off. Ya Allah. So here, Osama ibn Zayd. See your microphone again. So the, 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 the son, uh, the most beloved son of the most beloved, Zayd, Osama, he's most beloved. His father, Zayd ibn Haritha, the most beloved as well. They came to him, Bani Makhzum, because of a woman she had stolen. And the way she stole him, actually, she took something and a borrowal. And then when the people wanted their borrowal back, she said, no, you don't have anything. So she's basically denied it. And she's been caught red-handed. There was witnesses upon her. So, so uh, they wanted now, because her meta reached the Prophet So they wanted Osama, <clears throat> so that she was handed over to the Prophet. Her case has been presented, so there's no, way, there's no way back. They said to Osama, go and to see. Ask the Prophet, maybe he would just overlook this and keep a closed eye. So the Prophet, وسلم, he told him off. He said, أَتَشْفَعُ فِي حَدِّ مِنْ حُلُولِ اللَّهِ are you interceding to stop the implementation of a fixed prescribed punishment of Allah? How dare you? Then he left him and he went to the pulpit addressing the people. <coughs> and then he told him that the people before you, they were misguided, they were doomed, they were misled astray. Why? Because if the noble, strong person steals, they don't cut off his hand. If the person who is weak steals, they will cut off his hand. They will implement upon him the fist prescribed punishment. By Allah, if Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, is to steal, I will cut off her hand. Also, you can add here hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said the, this, the intercession of somebody had, if, if intercession of somebody had prevented the implementation of a prescribed punishment of implementation or the implementation of fixed prescribed punishment then he had gone against Allah's command he gone against Allah and his deen in the deen of which is not his deen that means the deen of Islam in his deen the deen of the person so you, you have actually gone against Allah's sharia ah. And this hadith is in Sisr al-Sahih of Sheikh al-Albani, 437. Man hala faqad fi means he had opposed Allah in his matter. Right, let's go to the following title, please. It is preferred to conceal the faults of a believer. Okay, we could add to the title here. It is preferred to conceal the believers faults and also to add to pardon and to pardon and not to convey the uh, crime to uh, the khalifa or the leader or the judge unless there is a benefit okay unless there's a benefit so because once it's raised to the khalifa and there's a fixed prescribed punishment he, there's no intercession so it is preferred to conceal, not just to conceal on, the, on a different person, also to conceal upon yourself if you've done it. If you fornicated, if you are, don't raise yourself to the matter, try to purify yourself with that repentance to Allah rather than to be having the prescribed punishment implemented upon you. Tfadlan. Abu Hurairah reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whoever conceals the fault of a Muslim, Allah will conceal his faults in this life and the hereafter. Okay, I'm going to second. There's a hadith here missing. I don't know if the new print has got it or the old print. Just one second, please. Yeah. Okay, we'll add a hadith here, inshallah. That's a hadith that's being added by the new print, the new version of this book, the concise. 
on the authority of Safwan ibn Umayyah. Well, just before I add this hadith, let's just talk a hadith Abu Hurairah. Abu Hurairah, he said that the Prophet Sallallahu said, he who conceals uh, uh, the faults of a Muslim, Allah will conceal his faults in this dunya and the akhirah. Uh, but actually, there was more of a direct hadith than this. And that is, and Safwan, on the authority of Safwan ibn Umayyah, he said, I was sleeping in the masjid. And I had a garment, uh, which is about 30 dirham, the cost of it. A man came and he stole it from me. So the man was caught and he was brought to the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet of Allah, he commanded for his hand to be amputated. So I came to him. This is the one whom the item of his being stolen. I said to him, Messenger of Allah, are you going to amputate his hand because of 30 dirham? I will, okay, I will sell it to him and I will basically give him the time that he likes to give me the money. That means it, 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 just consider that what he had taken from me is like that sale. So I, I'm selling it to him and let him pay me the, the 30 dirham whenever he wants. In, in, in installments, basically. So the Prophet وسلم, he said to him, if this was before this, before he came, brought him to me, before these people brought him to me red-handed, caught red-handed, he could have settled that issue before it reached me. So once the matter reaches the authority, the authority cannot say, well, we will consider intercession over that. It's not allowed. But before it reaches the authority, yes, amongst each other, okay, okay, brother, you stole my item. I will forgive you for that, but don't repeat it again. So that's before it reaches the, uh, the authorities. Also the hadith, man satara awrata akhihi al-Muslim, he who conceals the defects of his Muslim brother, Allah will conceal his defects on the day of resurrection. But he who exposes the defects of his brother Muslim, Allah will expose his defects uh, uh, Allah will expose his defects even he will be in his own house but this concealing we say it's actually it's, it's not open check it's not just without any restrictions no uh, as long as there is no uh, uh, wasting of other people's rights and as long as we know for the, that there is a sense of repentance and remorse from this person who committed the crime, then there's no, no harm. Actually, there's a big benefit to let him make tawbah instead of taking him to the authorities where the prescribed punishment is going to be 100 lashes, so it will be a scandal to everybody, or 80 lashes uh, for defamation, uh, uh, 100 lashes for fornication without marriage, or for example, stoning to death. It's, it's going to be a scandal for the family of the person as well. So... As long as we said the concealing of this crime of a person, there's a maslaha benefit for it. And there is no wasting or neglecting the rights of other people. Like, for example, somebody had killed somebody. And this person wants to repent, but I knew that he's a killer. I cannot conceal that. So I cannot hide that. Because here there is you know, the other peoples who had been there, person had been killed. Okay. They need to have the blood money or they need for him to be killed. So you cannot, you cannot conceal that. So a killer, no. Also rape. Rape is different from zina, even though the same crime in terms of punishment. But the rape here, if I'm going to conceal, he's this person, he had uh, 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 fornicated with a woman without her consent. It's always a woman. She will have the fornication. It's not the man. We've never had a case, for example, man is being raped. It's always the woman who will be raped. So... If it is the crime of a kill, of killing a person, or a crime of rape, we have to uh, uncover this crime, and we cannot conceal it. We have to raise it to the authorities. But if it is not going to affect others, then it's permissible to conceal it. So, for example, he who had seen a person who fornicated, fornication is with the consent of the two, and he had sensed from the two of them that they will be repenting, and he concealed upon them, that's good. Because repentance is better than taking them to the authorities. And you remember, you need four, four witnesses. 
seeing the actual thing and the actual things, seeing the actual fornication. Same thing with somebody if he stole, just like this person. The Prophet of Allah said, I wish that you have settled this before you raise the matter of this man who had stolen your garment, which cost 30 dirham, and his hand is going to be amputated. I mean, it's supposed to be like saying to me, why didn't you settle it before you came to me? If you just went to that person and said, Khalas, guys, because you saw him coming with you, you saw him being captured. Okay, so now when you knew that the punishment is like this, you want to say, let me consider that I have sold him this garment so that the implementation of the fixed prescribed punishment would not take place. Sorry, it being raised to the imam, to the judge, there is no intercession. So if somebody stolen something from somebody and he has some sort of sense of repentance or the item is not that much, okay, and you want to conceal upon him, it's better not to take him to the authorities. Uh, what is the proof for this? The proof for this is that the Prophet Sallam, he said to Hazal, Hazal is the person who had let Ma'iz to go to confess to the Prophet of Allah that he had made the fornication. He was married and his death, his, his fixed prescribed punishment was stoning to death. So he said to Hazal, after the whole, I'm going to say the whole hadith, inshallah. And you know, in that story, he ran off, he ran off and he said, my people deceived me. My people had told me that, you know, he was never thought that there would be death penalty like this. Okay. So he said to him after he was killed, he would have just, if you had, instead of making him to confess and coming to me to confess, okay, it would have been better for you, O Hazal, the one who was looked after him. He was like an orphan with him and he looked after Ma'iz. It would be better just to cover him with your own garment. It's better than what you have done. That is, you told him to come and confess to me. Just conceal for him his crime, his zina, his fornication. Because his repentance would be better. That's why the Prophet of Allah sent him three times back. Are you crazy? Go back. Woe to you. Go and seek forgiveness. Seek forgiveness. Don't come to, to me. But this person is still, he doesn't know the punishment. <laughs> he didn't know the punishment. And that's it. As soon as he saw the stones coming onto him, he ran off. He said, my people, you know, deceive me. Um, so when we see a person who is regretting what he has done, and as he was before he went to the Prophet, we should conceal for him and not to make uh, a scandal of him. You know, this is making a scandal of this person. Ma'az even, uh, we're going to see that the companions regarding his, when he was killed, when he was stoned, they were different. One is saying, yeah, this person is a fornicator, this person is type. But if this person, we don't sense from him repentance, and he's doing this fornication to all types of women, no, the society would be better off if this person is to be either is to be lashed if he is not married or to be stoned to death if he's married. So if he's a person who's going to, uh, uh, you know, basically ruin the honor and the reputation of Muslim communities by raping this woman by this raping this woman and fornicating with this woman and all of that then it would be better to disclose this matter to the authorities طيب. coming now to the following after that after abu huraira it is also it is also recommended that the individual keep his own faults concealed the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said Every one of my nation is apt to be forgiven except for those who commit sins openly. Included among those who commit sins openly is where a person performs a deed during the night. And although Allah has concealed that sin in the morning, he says, oh, so and so, last night I did such and such. He spent the night being concealed by Allah and in the morning he uncovered Allah's concealment from himself. Right. So also not just to conceal on other people's the crime if we sense from them. Uh, a tawbah and there is a benefit from that uh, also to conceal on yourself why should you go and confess that you drank Khalas, you drank now you repented to Allah repent to Allah instead of saying to the judge I have drank yesterday okay if you repent to Allah repentance Allah will forgive you for that <clears throat> the one who repents from his sin it's like he hasn't sinned what, do you, what more do you want so it is better than and of course, this hadith is talking about this person is not going to the authorities telling them that I've done so and so, please purify me. No, no, it's not. It's 
talking about he's talking that going to other people, his friends and all of that, not the judge, not the authorities. And he said that, you know, yesterday I was a fornicator and yesterday I was drinking. That's the person who will be exempt from being safe. Prophet Allah said, all my ummah are safe. Kullu ummati mu'afa, safe. Except for the one who talks about their sins openly. And how? You do them during the night, something that nobody can see you. And Allah had covered for you. She sin and you repent to Allah. But no, tomorrow you say, that means there's no sense of remorse or regret. That's what it is. You're telling the people, you know, you, got no sh no sh you have no shame to talk about your sin. If you're shame, that's alhamdulillah. If you have modesty, alhamdulillah. If you have haya from your, from your sin, alhamdulillah. But when you lose this haya and you don't care about the people knowing about your crimes and your a'udhu billah, satanic devilish works that you do during the night, then you're not safe. You are not safe, whether in this dunya or in the akhirah. We could add a hadith as well. تعافوا الحدود فيما بينكم عبد الله بن عمر رضي الله عنه وارضاه he said تعافوا الحدود pardon each other regarding the fixed prescribed punishment that means don't take the person who has done a, a, a crime that he deserved to be a fixed prescribed punishment straight away to the leader so as soon as that been done then the hack and the, the, the judge will implement it so if you are able to reconcile before it's gone it's better but if you think there is a maslaha to Raise him up, like we said when we talked, no problem. Do you remember that person is garment worth 30 dirhams being stolen with him, from him when he was in the masjid? You know, he, you know, he, he could have just settled this issue before this person was taken to the Prophet and the Prophet was going to amputate his hand. That's what the Prophet said. But if the matter, the crime was raised to me, then the prescribed punishment will take place. Okay, so it will take place. Uh, uh, so it is actually uh, a, a prompting us this hadith to overlook, okay, the crimes that would entail a fixed prescribed punishment and not to raise it to the leader unless there is a benefit from that. So and that is why the Prophet says, send ma'as four three times, go back. So once it comes to the imam, then the imam has to implement it. But the imam also has to check upon it. So if there's, if there's witnesses, that's it. If there's no, if it's him uh, uh, admitting it, the Prophet of Allah has to make sure, go back. He's giving you extra time. Think about it, don't give it to me. And once, as I said, he had uh, uh, basically came to the point where he has done the crime and there is no way that we have a, 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 a sort of a van or gesture or something like this, uh, and then the Ibam has to implement the prescribed punishment and it's not allowed for him to overlook it or keep a closed eye on it. Five. Uh, now we're coming to Al-Hudud Kafar. Fadl. The fixed prescribed punishment is expiation. Ubada ibn al-Samid said, we were with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a gathering and he said, Make the oath of allegiance to me that you will not associate anything with Allah, you will not steal, you will not commit fornication. And he mentioned everything in the verse. Then he said, and the verse in the verse here is the verse of Al Mumtahina, Surah Al Mumtahina, verse number 12, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan Nabi, O Prophet, Ida Ja'ak al Mu'minat, if the female believers come to you, uh, that is that is not to associate anything with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not associate anything with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to as well to commit burglary or to commit fornication and not to kill their children and not to bring a fornication that they have done between their hands or their legs and they don't really disobey you in something which is you've been commanded in, in good then accept the uh, the pledge from them and seek forgiveness for them for very Allah is the oft merciful oft forgiving now 
Then he said, Whoever fulfills it among you will have his reward upon Allah. If anyone falls into any of those things and is punished for it, that will be the expiation. If anyone falls into any of them and Allah conceals it for him, then it is up to Allah. If he wills, he will forgive him. And if he wills, he will punish him. Right. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said to these people to give the pledge to him, not to associate anything with Allah, and not to steal, and not to fornicate. He who does that, then his reward with Allah is Zawajah. He, if he did a crime of these, like he stole, he fornicated, he committed apostasy. He committed apostasy, he did not repent, of course, we said, and he, that would not be a sin expiation. But if he stole, if he uh, fornicated, and he had been punished for it in this dunya, prescribed punishment has been implemented upon him, then it will be his expiation. Khalas. No punishment in the hereafter. But if he had done one of these things, yet he had repented to Allah, Allah concealed it for him. He had not raised the matter to the judge. Then it is up to Allah. Allah might forgive him or might punish him, but after that he will be going to paradise. But remember, this is the person who committed the fornication and did not repent. He's still in the, in the will of Allah. He might forgive him even if he did not repent because maybe he did something good before. But let's say this person repented to Allah. Prophet of Allah said, As long as your tawbah repentance is 100%, your tawbah is fulfilling the condition, then it's like you haven't sinned. So there is no need for you to put your uh, fate uh, in the hands of the authorities. And then, as I said, it will be difficult for you later on to, um, I would say, to hide yourself from the people because the people will know about you. Your hands have been amputated because you're a thief. You will be shy to, to meet other people. So it's better for you not to raise this matter. Uh, or even for you to, to raise the matter of somebody as long as we know that he's going to be repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man yuqeem al-hudud, this is the last thing, but what we're going to add is double this. And this is going to be the next lecture. We're going to add, inshallah, more than double this. Fadl. Who is to implement the fixed prescribed punishments? The fixed prescribed punishments are not to be implemented except by the ruler or his representative, as the Prophet wasallam used to implement them during his lifetime, and his, and his successors did the same afterwards. He would also appoint someone to carry out the punishment, as when he said, Go, O Unais, to that woman, and if she confesses, stone her to death. Okay, we're going to come to her story in a minute. Bye. Uh, later on, inshallah, not today. Uh, so here we say that the one who is going to implement the prescribed punishment is the judge, the imam, the khalifa, or whoever he deputizes on his behalf. Fadl. It is permitted for the slave owner to, ex uh, to execute the legal punishment upon his slaves. The Prophet wasallam said, if a slave girl fornicates and it is proven, her owner should lash her and should not reproach her after that. Then, if she fornicates again, he should lash her and not reproach her. If she does it a third time, he should sell her, even if it be for a rope of hair. Right. So this is a, a prescribed punishment being implemented not by the Khalifa, by the person himself. That's onto his slaves, because his slaves is her property. So you have slaves, a woman she fornicated, a man she had a, a slave he had uh, drank. So you are allowed to fulfill, you don't have to raise it to the Khalifa, you will are allowed to uh, make this prescribed punishment onto your slaves. And here he says that the woman, if she fornicates and their fornication is being clear, clarified, then let him, uh, but then, by the way, slaves, they don't have stony to death. Okay? They will have 50 lashes. So if her, if her fornication is being app approved, then uh, let him Lash her and let to reproach her, mm. actually to rebuke her. I mean, not to call her, for example, you fornicator. That's it, you've lashed her. Can't I just call her you fornicator. If she did it again, okay, and then let you lash her again, which is the 50 lashes, and do not rebuke her, do not really sort of humiliate her. So don't call her your fornicator, your fasiqa, your rubbish. Your... That's it, you've done the punishment. Don't exceed. And if she did the third one, uh, he says, let you sell her. Here it is for recommendation. It's not a command. You don't have to sell her. But because she it might affect your family. Children look at her like a fornicator. 
Okay, she might affect your family. But if he sends from her, for example, she's going to repent to Allah after the third one, could keep her. But if you send that to she's a woman, this has got no respect, or this man has got no respect to the moral, the morality, then sell her even with what? A habl, a rope made of wool. Is that what he said, uh, Ismail? A rope made of wool? He says made of hair. Made of hair. Uh, hair, yani, yani, shar, yes, made of hair, which means worth nothing. Worth nothing. But also, we have. And by the way, this is opinion of the majority of the scholars, save Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa, no. He says, no, it has to be the Khalifa. Abdul Razak in the Musannaf, he says that Nafa, and this is authentic, the servant of Abdullah ibn Umar, that Abdullah ibn Umar, he had cut off the hand of a slave of his who had stolen, and also he lashed a slave of his who had fornicated <clears throat> without taking the matter to the authorities. And this is a, as well clear or uh, uh, hadith or an athar from the companion he did not take it take the matter to the authorities <coughs> we stop here inshallah and we continue next week but we have a number of issues to talk about we talk about to push away the implementation of the fixed prescribed punishment with shubuhat means doubtful matters we don't implement it and also to uh uh, 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 that is when the prescribed punishment will not be implemented, they fall out, we can't, we can't implement them. And also, we're going to talk about the <clears throat> tawbah, repentance, and its effect into the prescribed punishment. <coughs> Somebody repented before he'd be in court, does that help or not? And also, <clears throat> to evade the face, would you make the to uh, to implement the fixed prescribed punishment to evade the face and also it is prohibited to establish the prescribed punishment in the masajid uh we're going to talk about as well as well issues like which is the conditions for the prescribed punishment to be implemented all of that will be inshallah next week i mean next class in two weeks time if you have any questions regarding what you heard please go ahead jazakumullah Please go ahead, Imran. I can't see your hands raised out. How did you know that? How do you know? I can see his. I don't know why you can't see it, Sheikh. Oh, yeah, I could see him now. <laughs> I'm not going up. Uh, yeah, Sheikh, my question is, um, you know, when there is difference of opinions, a certain fiqh, how should a ruler implement that? The ruler, he will take whatever he wants, he feels is correct according to his scholars but what he takes is supposed to be the uh, basically the norm that other scholars they can't say for example why did he implement Abu Hanifa or other scholars so in terms of when we have a khilaf and the leader had chosen one of them then that chosen whatever it has to be the one that we should be abiding ourselves with it so there's a real khilaf real which is real means like justified difference among the scholars not just any difference justified yeah, yeah. and okay. in this this proofs on both sides if the khalifa chose one of them then we have as people who are under this ruler we have to abide with that one i'll give you an example salatul ghaib the prayer on the person who is dead somewhere else he died in somewhere else different city, different country. The Sukaha had differed. Do we pray on this person even he died in a different country? Most of the scholars, they said, yes, you're allowed. But the few scholars they said, it's not allowed. And we're going along with this not allowed because of the hadith of the Prophet and from the fiqh, we say, from the, from the fiqh of the hadith, the Prophet of Allah, he died, no other Muslims from their companions have prayed upon him. For example, like Usama, he was outside the Medina. He did not offer Salat al-Ghaib on the Prophet. Only we offer on the Salat on the Ghaib, on the person, if there was nobody to pray upon him, like the Najashi. So we have a difference among the scholars. So if the head of the country adopted that there is Salat al-Ghaib, and he had made the masajid to make Salat al-Ghaib prayer on the absent, on such and such person, I am a person who is a Salafi. I cannot just go to the masjid and oppose, or a, let's say the Imam of the masjid. I have to pray it. Because the Khalifa had chosen that particular fiqh, 
even though it goes against what I'm saying. And I'm saying this is wrong. But this is, as I said, where the proofs are there for both sides. For me, I could see clearly there's no Salat al ghayb but because of the Khalifa, he had chosen this particular one, according to what he believes that the scholars who are told him this is the correct opinion, we adopt that opinion. Uh, if I'm uh, I don't, if I'm not in the masjid, I'm not a I'm not a person who is the imam. I don't have to go there. But if I'm the imam, I cannot just leave the masjid because of that. Now, Thank Allah you. Ta'ala. Now, Thank you. Yeah. The only other question is off topic, if you allow it, Sheikh. Um, the question is saying that he purchased a T-shirt and he didn't know that it's got 10% silk in it. Is it permissible for him to use that, wear it as a man? 10% silk is, is not uh, silk. It's like 10% gold. It's not gold in a, in a metal, like gold plated. And silk, I don't think the silk here, you're talking about the real silk. You're talking about artificial silk. It's not the silk. I think it's manufactured silk. So it's not the silk which is the worm that had done it. Okay, so it's not allowed. It's allowed, inshallah. There's a sister that um, you've clarified, but she's asking if the matter goes to the authorities and the person says, I repent for this crime. She just wants to clarify. So do they still get. I, I, I cannot answer this because I said I'm going to talk about it next week, next class. Sorry, Sheikh, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. We just said we're going to talk about the repentance, inshallah. This is another, it's an ed title. It's not simple. I'm going to be about another 10 minutes for this. So we'll leave that, inshallah, for next class. Anything else? That's all that I have in this brothers and sisters. Yeah, it's, like it's, it's going to get more, inshallah, more as well interesting next time. Because we're going to talk about things which is not in the book. We're going to add them, inshallah. So I've written here about uh, two pages. So we'll be, inshallah, talking about them. So this is uh, very interesting about the prescribed punishment, just to show you that this is from Allah. Wallahi, any person look at this, he will know that nobody can do such a thing. It has to be this religion from Allah Azza wa Jal. It has to be the divine, because it's, everything is in system and organized. Subhanakallah, bihamdik.